Okay, we are back into open session. Um, TJ Johnson is with us by phone now, so just so you're aware of that as well. Um, next we have the track update. Mr. Crenshaw. Yes. So I just, I shared last time some uh, numbers and, and basically said that in my mind the track was dead and we're done. Um, Mrs. Flynn is not so easily swayed. So she started talking about the company from Uniontown, Kansas, who put that rubber top on that lasted for 16 years. And Greta found the file from that whole project and I called him. And actually, it may not be as, this subject may not be as dead as I thought it was. Currently, he could peel that rubber off, patch the asphalt, and do the exact same thing that was done in the past. And it would be 150000 or less. This particular guy has been doing this for 30 years. He developed and patented a product that's an underlayment to rubber tracks. So if you've ever installed a laminate floor or seen them, a pergo, that foam that you put down, he patented a product that goes down and then he puts rubber on top of it. So the difference between the two ideas is if he does what he did, then he will guarantee it will end up like it is in eight to 10 years. It, he guarantees it will crack because our base is faulty. Um, having the underlayment, he guarantees it will not crack and it will be waterproof. There's a catch. That process is about $450,000. Yeah. So, I have been in contact with Mr. Betts. He is very excited with the first option because if you look at our original bids of about $900,000, if we can get tracks that last eight to 10 years, we can put a new top on it for many, many decades until we've spent $900,000. So it is a Band-Aid kind of deal. However, it's a Band-Aid that saves us money in the long haul. So uh, Mr. Betts is on the April agenda. He is actively pursuing uh, some financial ideas and he'll be hopefully bringing something to the table April 12, and we can try to get on this guy's books. Summer is really busy for him. He is coming here in the next week or two on a business trip further west, and he's gonna stop, and he's gonna look, and he's gonna measure, and he'll be able to give us a really solid number. And even if we have to wait until the fall, he said he's done many because everybody wants it done in the summer. He's done many of them in the fall, he promises he won't disrupt football or anything else as long as the coaches are willing to work with him. So I am cautiously optimistic, and I thank Mrs. Flynn for being persistent and continuing to look for ideas. So that's exciting news. Um, so you, you said that the layer, if he put the layer between the base and the rubber top, that's where the 400000 comes in? Yes. Okay. Is that extra or is that his total? That's peeling off the rubber, putting down his patented base, and then putting the rubber track on top of it. But we're looking at just peeling off, so fixing the crack asphalt and putting his stuff, not putting his stuff on. That's the, that's the least expensive, most viable option. Yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, a Chevy or a Cadillac. We're going to have to go for Chevy. I think so. and no guarantee other than he promises and guarantees that that rubber will crack as it ages because of the yeah. asphalt. Hopefully he can evaluate that when he comes mm -hmm. and we can yeah. have that kind of a discussion. I know that the, 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 pat the patching material, a lot of technology has changed in 16 years 
and I just need to have him here to look at it so we can get a, a good, honest opinion. I have, a, I have a comment. This is real good news to hear for a school in our community. I have learned here this last week a couple of things on some uh, area tracks that uh, there's a district here in Kansas, southeast of Sleen, who uh, they had closed their track down to track meets just like we have for a couple of years before the before plan came together. And also, I learned of two schools south of Slime that uh, they just uh, they have torn out their track and put limestone millings down, and uh, they can still operate as a walking track, as a practice track, and everything. They just don't have track meets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're not uh, totally out of the water if we don't get something done. Like I said, I hope, we can hope something comes together on this uh, things that are made present here this evening. But uh, also at the same time, uh, uh, renting a track, I don't believe costs all that much compared to a major rebuild and overall brand new kind of thing. So I think we have lots of options out there. We need to just not be uh, zoned in on the target that each of us want. Mm -hmm. okay. and, I, and I would say this. One of the things that impressed me about the community when I was visiting we have a beautiful facility there. The, the stadium is awesome. We have some of the best grass on the football field that I've seen in a long time. We have a wonderful sidewalk with the lamps and the rock posts. That is a, that's a uh, gym. And if we can figure out the track, then that will be an incredible facility. So he should have a better number for us by April. Okay, that's really good, that's promising. Any other discussion? Okay. That's really good news. <laughs> Much better. That is good news. And Mr. Betts so, is really excited uh, because he that's an achievable target. 900 grand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that rough, is, but it's an achievable target. Yeah. When you're, like David said, you know, that was pretty much a, you know, out of the water, you know, but now, I mean, there's other options. So, yeah. having surgery next Wednesday and I just don't know if I can get back here in time for a board meeting so um, I talked to Patty and we thought let's just put it on there and talk about it. Yeah. Um, I talked to LaDonna on the phone. I don't have uh, an email this time from her. Uh, we, we have, uh, I think she said they've tested like 30 tests in the last week or two. Uh, we don't have a significant issue as of right now. Um, I did send a survey out to the staff to ask what they thought, and the questions, let's see, so the questions are, are they certified classified, do you support making mass optional for students, and what building do you spend the majority of your time? So if we kind of go backwards, we got a good 50-50 mix. We got 48 responses, half from the elementary school, half from junior, senior, high. Uh, we had 61.2% certified response, 38.8. This is the magic question right there. Do you support removing the mask mandate and making masks optional for students and staff? And it is 75.5% in favor of that. 24.5 opposed to that. I have expressed my opinion as your superintendent of recommendations. Um, we are coming up on state assessments. We have prom coming up and we have graduation coming up. 
LaDonna understands the desire and understands that we don't have issues right now. But if we do have issues, quarantines will go back into effect. And we had kids miss graduation last year, even in July, because of the quarantine. So, I, I just urge you to consider and to ponder the long-term effect on this. My personal opinion doesn't matter, but I will tell you, maybe some of the reason we are where we are is because of what we have done. I don't have any data that supports that. It's simply an opinion. Um, but I wanted to share these two pieces of information with you. Not only is it a mask issue, it's also do we open our facilities back up. We have people requesting to use our facilities again. And I don't have solid data to say that a no. But that's something that you know we just need to figure out. Wouldn't the decision to have choice of mask or most mask and opening our facilities up be two different decisions? I think so. Yes. yes. And the option was, I, I did get an email from a staff member that said we left out the option of teachers having the ability to have a mandate in their classroom or not. And I will say this, my only concern in a multiple student family is if you have two or three kids and one kid has to wear a mask all day and the other two or three don't, that's going to cause some, um, that's just a disparity thing in my mind. So, but it was brought up that that is an option that you could consider and I just wanted to make sure that you understood that is an option teacher directed for their own classrooms. from experience having two kiddos last year that didn't get to go to their prom, didn't get to do their senior year of track, um, my kids of course didn't get their baseball, softball, um, and then of course graduation. It's tough. Yes, it made them stronger. I understand that, but it is, it's, it's tough on those because they don't get a chance to come back to do prom. They don't get a chance to come back and do their senior year and things like that. So, um, you know, instead of just coming back from spring break, you know, who knows what's going around um, with that. But that's, I'm just speaking from personal experience. So, um, so it's, it's tough on the kids. It, it really is. So. Mr. Dodge, I believe I get the grandchild to the statement you made there. I think what the reason why we are at graduation think so. I mean, you're, you're saying the kids would have to wear masks at the prom yeah. Yeah. and graduation? If, if it remained in effect, yes. In effect. Currently, the prom that's scheduled has masks in place. But if, if this were lifted, then they wouldn't be in place. It would be a choice. It would be an option. It would be a personal choice. I think we've all gone long enough. Is there a treatment for COVID? If you're sick with COVID, can you go in and get a treatment? Not per se. People know that if you're going to go get tested, there's a chance you're going to get quarantined. If, if you're sick, stay home. If you're not sick, do it. If you're a senior, be careful. We're all smart enough to, to take the risks into our, to be able to do it. It's, I don't know, this whole, everybody needs to do this for this 25% or whatever, you know, if, it's America. We should all have our personal freedoms to do what we want. If you want to wear a mask, and if you wear a mask to school every day and you don't have to be quarantined because you have your mask on, then let the seniors wear a mask every day if they're worried about being quarantined, and they won't be, right? Because that's what I understand. It's their option. It, it, so I, I would make a motion that we go back to optional immediately. I 
tell you. Teachers have all had options to get the COVID-19 vaccine. If the vaccine's worth anything, then it should be taken care of. But that doesn't guarantee you yeah. not spreading it, though. Well, I understand that doesn't guarantee yeah. not spreading it, but if you're a teacher and you're concerned about your health, hopefully you got the vaccine and you shouldn't contract the virus. If well, I'm the COVID vaccine is not 100% bulletproof. got to remember this is America, and the degree, and the degree, something like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have a motion by John, seconded by David, that USC 298 um, Board of Education move the mask to recommended, but not required, effective immediately. Is that what you said? Any other, is that what you said? Yeah, that's basically optional, right? Optional. Yeah. yeah. But but recommended. No. Optional but recommended. I would just say optional. Optional. Just optional. Okay. We've all been considered the news all enough. Okay. All right. So I'm going to reread this just to make sure we're okay. So motion by John, seconded by David, USC 298 Board of Education approved moving mat to mass as optional, but not required. Yes. For USD 298, um, effective immediately. Yes. And, and the only thing I would add, and I, I understand tornado drills and stuff at the grade school where kids have to be in real close contact. If I think at the beginning of the year we had one of those, and all the kids were asked to bring a mask to school for that particular drill. And so if, if that is something that is outside of what we do here and allows the principal to do that, that is fine. It, I, I understand there's super a mass close gathering. quarters and there's a mass gathering that it may be required. But that was that was done at the beginning of the year because I remember all the kids were asked to bring their masks for a tornado drill. So I don't know if that was outside of what we did here or not. But the problem would be on mass gathering technically, right? Mm -hmm. Is um, that what yeah. it would be? I mean, I don't know what the problem is. The kids are in pretty yeah. close proximity yeah. and there's okay, a lot of them. It. Okay, I don't want to leave it off. I mean, I just... Yes, I understand. Thank you. That's, Thank you. That would be a mass gathering. I think that's great. I'll let tomorrow I'm starting. I've seen the same okay. thing. Yes. Optional, but not required. Optional, but not required. Okay. Effective immediately. Is the motion on the table? Any further discussion? So there's that problem, but I guess I'm oh with you. So we're three? So four and three? Okay. So motion carried. Okay, so now moving on to facilities use, opening or not. Yes, I'm thinking oh, sorry, go ahead. Well just for clarification, that would include the weight room, the card, the people that have the card, and the organizations. So 
individual so and be, organizational use. This would be turning on the community access. Yes. Right, so people could go up there yes. and yes. go basketball with weights, yes. walk. I think our first responsibility so, is kids in the streets. Did we discover a way to sanitize at the right time of day to make it work? Christy was going to maybe look into that because I didn't want to call it. Give me my question because I don't want to have somebody have to come in on Sunday night. Have to have and have to have come in yeah. at night. Every night at 9 or 10 o'clock when people were done. Well, um, I think that is. Before. But I think that's asking too much of our our employees may go to the first two. Yes. 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 Could there be an idea, just an idea of like if the right thing to use something that they were willing to clean up after themselves and save time? Is that an option or? Well, they would know. Those those big areas would take the use of those uh, 360 fog machines. It okay. just wouldn't be something that. Okay. Well, could, could we open it to organizations and not community access because then. Then it would be a planned event, it would be a scheduled. And I don't know if the rest of have anything that's going to be indoors at any time soon, but. Well, I like the draw, dance competition that's yeah. that are there. And I would draw the distinction between the weight room where everybody's touching everything and the gym where somebody, you got to bring your own basketball. And you know what yes. I'm saying? I would, I would see a difference between that sweating, laying on benches, touching every weight bar and things, but. In my mind, I would see a difference as opposed to having the dance recital. If they brought their own basketball, they would basically just be in there shooting and, yeah. Oh, they're kids in the bathroom. Yeah. Or they can, I mean, they can, they can go in the locker rooms too because they're not off limits. That's true. So no, maybe that's a, not as distinct as I thought. Yeah, everything they would be at is what I was thinking. There's not a way to just say specifically the use of the gym, is the but is the only thing they could use? I don't know. You can't get directly in that way. to the gym. Yeah. Without providing a restroom facility, which is the locker room. Okay. Which gym versus the gym? Yeah. Well, I was thinking maybe it's just not something to just the gym, but mm -hmm. if they have to have access to the changing rooms and Very, very upset because like, we own that school, our taxes pay for it, but you prevent yes. us from coming yes. into that building, yes. and that's you shouldn't be able to. Yeah. But then you, it wasn't up until just years, or how many years ago, that we opened it up to public access, they could go in whenever they wanted to. So yeah. I think it's our first job going back. I think I agree with David. I think our first priority needs to be our kids and our staff. Because, yeah, they did not used to have our facilities open up that they could go in and walk or shoot hoops or whatever. Um, I would like to readdress this issue after school time. Okay. Well, I, I think we should allow organizations, if they plan like, like a Saturday or some planned event, I, I think that would be okay. I don't think we should have community. I'm okay with the not community access, but I would like to see us allow like if they wanted to have an event, if they wanted to have an event on April fourth, so we can sanitize so after sanitize yes. yes. okay. yes. so it was a scheduled event, like a dance yes. recital, yes. or if a group wanted to use it for something, yes. if the rec wanted to schedule a some sort of tournament in the gym or something, yes. then they could attempt to coordinate. So we could yes. coordinate yes. how we're going to clean. Yes. I think it's just going to be a nightmare, honestly. Yeah. Um, well, may I add a piece that. to this discussion? Yes. Um, so one thing to think about for us, I know the dance recital has been mentioned, and we always enjoy having that dance recital because I know it's a vital part of the community. If you think about the stage, one crucial piece to this is the stage is still used as a lunchroom. Every single day, it is packed full of desks with a refrigerator now, um, a milk crate, etc. And so if we were to open that up, that's going to require us to do quite a bit of maneuvering. Um, having a dance recital as soon as school gets out would be something definitely we could consider because we would have the time to move all of that, but the way it's used right now, it is used as a lunchroom. Well, it typically is the Saturday after school's out. Okay, 
And that would be something that we could move all of that and, and go from there. So I just wanted to put, to put that piece in there. Yeah, yeah. Because it couldn't be her stage. Yes, the stage is. But we could just yes. say, the know, stage is used because it's being used, but that's not available. stage is not accessible and it could just be if somebody wanted to use one of the buildings we said you can't use the trade school stage right now because it's being used for other things. Oh, so they so what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah she, there's just, I totally understand having to move everything and that's not right. feasible and like if you have to set up something but if somebody asks what they can use we can always say okay the high school gym is available I don't know if the high school commons area would be available. That would, I would assume so because it can be cleaned on a known basis, and possibly the whole gymnasium at the grade school, but the stage is not in use. So, does that need to be a motion that we could allow use of high school gym, grade school gym minus the stage and the commons area? For scheduled events. And with a, with a two week with a two week notice. So then you're gonna get your your restrooms and your locker rooms and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well that's why if we have the notice and everybody do we usually get rental payments for renting it? I thought with soil conservation we always had to we pay. We had to pay, but I don't know. Rent might be I think it's in our agreement. It's part of them, so they don't have to. Yeah. So if it's an agreement, then we've already had an agreement. So. Does it have to be a motion if we decide not to do anything? Just leave it as 
Purchase that exceeds ten thousand or ten thousand dollars. So, even though it's CARES money, it's still an expenditure that I need your approval for. So, what we're looking at here is two walk-behind scrubber disinfectors, kind of like what you see at Walmart or whatever. A big box store has the curved squeegee at the back end, so it dispenses liquid, it cleans, and then it sucks that liquid back up. Um, because it is for disinfecting as well as cleaning, it falls under a CARES Act allowable expense. These uh, machines were brought out and demoed for us, and the reason for the upgrade is because we have 20-year-old machines. We currently have machines that you have to pre-mix your chemical with the water, so at the end of the day, if you haven't used everything, when you drain your tank, you're draining good chemical down. These are a post-mix, if you will, so there's a water tank and a chemical tank, and at the end of the day, you dump your water, you keep your chemical. These machines, one of them is a stand-on machine, which the elementary school preferred, and one of them is a walk-behind machine that the high school preferred. The other things that these machines can do is strip the wax off the floor with a special pad. Um, what I was looking at was not only the disinfection, the efficiency of a uh, post-mix uh, chemical, the chemicals are inexpensive, uh, but also the efficiencies of labor because I've watched custodians at the high school mop the uh, lunchroom with a mop, and this machine will allow them to have a 20-inch pass every time, like a Zamboni ice machine in a hockey game. So I think it will speed things up, it will do a better job, it will keep clean chemicals and water on the floor, and I think in the summertime it will be a huge benefit in the uh, refinishing of the floor. So I'm requesting that you approve these two bids, totaling $14,600 maybe, and some change. Is the extra due to amount of trade-in or due to... Walk behind versus walk behind versus right on. Um, one of the things that I have a lot of fun doing talking with vendors is you can see that there's a trade in there of two hundred dollars per machine on old machines. But I like having fun with them and saying, okay, if I buy two machines, what kind of bulk discount do I get? So if I, if we buy two machines at one time, they take another four hundred dollars off. Yeah, four hundred dollars. Yeah, $400 off list plus $200 trade-in. And the $400 isn't reflected in that invoice price because they need to make sure that we buy two machines. For the actual purchase price, we probably this, it would probably be less than two. It would be $400 less than that. So $14,181.83. $13,000. I would ask that you just approve the purchase of these two machines if I can get a better deal fine. If I need to get some chemicals with it, then we can just run that through as well. So, so do we need to not just see the 15 then? Or do we need to put this in the house? Move to approve purchasing those scrubbers. Approved. Okay, I'll do that. Yes, sir. And fully loaded with chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I can go back to 
right to the negotiating okay. table and say, so, in the case of disinfectant, whatever. Yeah, you might do it. Sure. All right, so motion by Deb, second by David, the USC 298 Board of Education authorizes future purchase of two floor scrubbers with the CARES Act money. Off because I want to make sure everybody can hear everything, especially anybody who's watching you. How can I make this even smaller? We can't see you. Perfect. Um, okay. Things are happening very quickly in the state legislature. They have two more weeks and they're doing a lot of what's called gut and go bills where they'll pull things out, they throw things in, they change numbers of bills. Um, so I have spent a lot of time this week reevaluating where we are financially. Um, but I do want to say this. I committed to you and I committed to this community to be transparent. And hopefully we earned some trust with that at our transportation meetings that we had over the busing issue. And I promise that I will continue to do that. Some of the information I'm going to share with you is hopeful. Some of the information I'm going to share with you is not so hopeful. But it's not an emotional uh, situation. It is numbers, and it is data, and it is what it is. So what I show you tonight is for your consideration moving forward. My goal as your superintendent and what you've entrusted me with is to manage this school district financially in all operations, and I'm committed to doing that. Uh, quitting and failure are not words that are in my vocabulary very often. It doesn't matter how ugly the truth is, the truth is simply the truth. So I want to share that. I would also encourage to any patrons that are watching or to you board members, please come and see me if you have specific questions or concerns, because I would be more than happy that all of our numbers are public. I would be very happy to have dis discussions. I would be very happy to have explanations. I would be very happy to have input, because we're all in this together. Um, but as we move through this, what I want to share with you is the really good news. So I have spent time with uh, uh, Greenbush financial people and we have been working on projections. And everything that I showed at the transportation meeting showed a decline in every account that we had. Every student enrollment number was a decline. If, and this is merely an estimate, understand that, we have until June 30 that we need to survive. If we don't have any major hiccups, these are the current projections for year end, which I'm pleased with, it, it changes the downward trend. These are our total operating funds. Last year we ended with $29,000. This year we're estimated to end with $101,000. In capital outlay, we're projected to be in better position than we were last year. Nothing makes me more excited than to see lines going up and not down. So when you look at these totals, 
we were looking at $71,000 over the last year end. And what that will do in our operating funds is give us the opportunity to transfer funds at the end of the year. And here's why this is so critical. We started this year with zero dollars in food service. We couldn't buy a carton of milk because we didn't have any money to transfer in there for food service at the end of the year. In special education, we started with zero dollars in that fund. Anything that you can transfer over at the end of the year gives you that cushion, number one, to get started in food service, number two, to get sped a little less uh, painful, but we weren't able to do that. So what I need you to understand on these, these are savings. This isn't spendable revenue. This is recovery mode, if that makes sense. Capital outlay is our bricks and mortar, and I know we've talked about it a lot. Uh, we ended last year with $75,000 in capital outlay. You can't buy much of anything or repair much of anything with that sort of a balance. Uh, I shared at the transportation meeting, for an example of a neighboring district, Sylvan Grove had $549,000 in capital outlay. So that's not a bad number to have. You don't need $5 million in capital outlay, but you need enough money to prepare for the worst. And so that needs to stay and it needs to continue to build. This is an email that I shared with you earlier and I also shared with transportation. When I talk about funding reductions, I just want you to know these are numbers and these are research numbers. It's not an opinion of mine. It's an opinion of the finance director of the state of Kansas because I sat down with him in Topeka and we worked through this thing. So when I say there's an expectation of a $72,000 reduction in state funding because of our student enrollment decline, I just want you to understand that's not my made-up number. This is what we have to look at and we have to deal with. Um, we will go from a 330 student count to a 311 student count. We are off of our three-year high, and they say it in a confusing manner, but what they say is, you can use your current year enrollment or the previous year or the second previous year. I call it a three-year high because it makes more sense to me. Um, so we're going to reestablish next year a budget based on our completed audit of student count, but our September 20 count was 311 students. That's a 19-student reduction off of our three-year high. That's with added with the waiting, the at-risk waiting, um, free and reduced lunch waiting, and just because we're lucky, they are revamping the transportation formula and we can no longer use the old transportation formula because of our cycle. We are now under the new transportation formula, which you can see will cost the district about $15,000 in transportation waiting as well. That's where that 71,940 comes from. The good news was the upward swings. Now we're getting to some ugly facts, okay? Our declining enrollment will cost us $71,940. Right now, the Senate and the House are debating high-density at-risk funding. We get 8.3 FTE, student FTEs, which means they say we have this need for at-risk, so they'll allow us 8.3 more students' worth of funding. That's how they do weightings, how many FTEs. We have like 154 transportation FTEs. So when they add it together, we may get funding for 400 kids. We don't have them. It's that added student count for weightings, just so everybody understands. Right now, the Senate has already passed a bill that does away with at-risk funding this year, and it won't be available next year. The House bill is currently saying, allow this funding for next year, but it will go away the following year. And they're in the middle of this deal where we have to wait and see. But what I want these numbers to reflect is this philosophy. We need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And so these are just realities. 
the LOB reduction. Sometimes it's a local option budget, also called supplemental general. Um, it, it is 30% of our general fund. So once we get our state aid, then we calculate 30% of that, and that's the taxes that get collected locally. So if our funding goes down $71,000, we lose 30% of that reduction as well. And that calculates out to be that 28740 So the truth of the matter is, currently, we could be looking at $139,739 reduction in funding overall next year. That keeps me up at night. But it is what it is. And I, oh, you, you can turn your slides over. I just didn't want you reading ahead. I'm sorry. So you can take notes on your papers that I sent out. Okay. This is so important that I wanted you to have paper copies of these because as your constituents contact you, I want you to have this information so that you don't have to rely on your memory and you don't have to rely on your notes. This is critically important that everybody understands the truth of where we are. This didn't happen overnight. Um, however, it is where we are. All of those declining numbers occurred over five or six years. Nothing significant took place to save money. So, as we continue to operate as normal, as student numbers went down, we continued to keep a high level of expense. So we are at where we are at, and it just is what it is. I would say this to the board and to our patrons, I fully believe we should be expected to live within our means. I had in my admin meeting today, I told my administrators, you can't go out and overbuy a house or overbuy a car and then go to your employer and say, geez, I can't pay my bills, I need a raise. Well, we have a responsibility to live within our means as well as a school district. So that's why we're having to have these conversations. We have to make adjustments to be responsible and stewards of the tax monies that support us. We have to figure out strategies to live within our means. Okay. So, we have a couple of options. And before I go into these, neither of them are pleasant. But again, you deserve the truth. Our patrons deserve the truth. So, I am sharing with you a couple of options that we have in order to recover funding. Salaries in a school district are typically 70 to 85% of the overall budget. So that is where significant reductions in spending take place. Uh, programs, it would take five programs to equal a salary. Programs are what keeps kids involved. It keeps them motivated. It builds school pride. It builds community pride. And I highly disagree with cutting programs. If anything, I think we need to increase programs and find other areas for disengaged students to become engaged and be a part of our school community. We can absorb, and, and this doesn't mean letting people go. This means figure out how to absorb attrition naturally. Uh, and we'll have a chat about that in a second. The other option is every school board has the authority to authorize local option budget to 33%. And I have an, al an analysis of that coming up that I'll share with you also. My job is to pre present you with everything I can find out. And if you remember Gary Seacrest's meeting where he had a line of board role, this, this is a board role. Knowing where we're heading is a board role. Executing what you want me to do is my job. So I am I am laying everything out there for your consideration. This isn't fear-mongering. This is just sharing facts so the board can make a very informed decision on how we move forward and start living within our means. So here are some numbers of thresholds of classes. And I can tell you this, 
the first thing you could tell me is, we're not Salina, we're not Lawrence, we're a small rural community. And you're absolutely right. However, these districts have enough money if they thought class sizes of 12 were the best thing, they can afford to build another school. These districts have millions of dollars in capital outlay and reserve funds. What I use these two districts for is simply this. If they weren't effective with these size classes, they would do something about it because these school districts have much better test scores than we do. So the reality that we must face is, why do we have small classes? And one idea is because it is a cultural mindset, not a data-driven decision. So I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt today reached out to some other districts that are closer to us in equivalent in size, and I just want to share some of the things she found. Some of the school districts didn't get back with her. Uh, Bennington, um, two sections are, are per grade level as they are usually in the high 20s to 30s per grade level. Uh, it's not in uncommon in the past at Tescott uh, Bennington to have one section of students in a grade of 19 to 25 students. Uh, Lakeside, they have no set threshold. They have classes one grade level that range from 9 to 19 students. Next year the incoming kindergarten will be 24 and they will have one teacher for that section. Thunder Ridge, lower class numbers in the last year, however, one classroom was 20 to 25 students. Uh, and then in some 2A schools, uh, Hoisington, for example, K-1 is 20 student max, but 2 through 5th grade caps at 25. So when I say threshold, what I mean is when you get to that level in a Lawrence, for an example, that's when they start the discussion of whether they should bring. It's not automatic. They have a range of, say, 24 to 30. At 24, they start having the discussion, do they need a plan on expanding? So those are just some items of information that I want you to be aware of. So let's talk about mill levy, which goes into uh, LOB. This is the mill levies since 2016 that I found on old school budgets in the file cabinet, up to current. So it has ranged from 51.7 mills to the low of last year of 47.036 mills. And our current county assessed valuation is 42,381,395. So one mill, the easiest way to always figure a mill is just move the decimal point three places to the left. And there's your per mill dollar value. Um, and I don't want to sound like I'm being silly and being, uh, what do I want to say, condescending. I just want to make sure everybody that's listening has the same opportunity to understand this uh, because it'll make your head spin. And my head's been spinning for days. Uh, so one mill of taxation here, countywide, raises $42,381. To give you kind of a funny idea, you raise a mill in Johnson County, you might get $5 million out of it. It's just based on valuation. You know? uh, so with that in mind, I would like to take you through what exercising 33% looks like. Um, I, there are three different districts that I know of that surround us, and I didn't put them in my notes, and I apologize. Uh, Smoky Hill has been at 33% for years. Um, and in my soup meeting, out of the 10 superintendents that on there were on there, uh, four of them were at 33%, and the others were at 31%. So just understand, this isn't an anomaly. And I'm not asking it, and I'm not advocating for it. I'm presenting facts to you. You know, anything that happens tax-wise affects me as well. I moved here. I'm all in here. It, I, will, I will be affected by this as much as, in, well, not as much as anybody else, but it will affect me. So I have skin in this game as well. I'm merely giving you information. So if you look at our budget, our published budget that we put in the paper, 
our general fund was that three million two thirty five seven sixty six our LOP revenue that's on the next line down if you divide nine hundred and seventy seven thousand eight hundred and eighty by three point two blah blah you come up with thirty percent now what I did for next year's scenario because I don't have accurate numbers I used this year's funding to create a scenario and I need you to understand we don't know what our state aid is going to be yet so I needed something to go off of so in this 21-22 scenario I took this year's fund subtracted the reduction in funding in state aid and then I took that at 30 percent and that's where we see a reduction in LOB of $28,740. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If general fund goes down, LOB goes down. That's how I got that compilation of three general, the possible at risk, and the possible reduction in LOB. So if we went to 33%, and understand, and I need to make this very, very clear, that extra three is a percentage, not a mill. Okay? And we'll look at that in just a second here. So if I took the same reduced state aid that I had on this side, 316826, I took that at 33%. That increases our revenue from the 949 to 1.04, a difference of $94,000. Now, I would also like to clarify so everybody understands this. The LOB authority is a ceiling, not a requirement. So what this does is it authorizes to go to 33% but it does not mandate it to go to 33%. And that's very important to know. Right now at 30%, that is the ceiling that we can get to, or the lid, if you will. Uh, what this does is, is raise the lid a little bit. So as we go through, let's look what this looks like. In order to go from 30% to 33%, that would generate $94,915 more dollars. If you divide that by the amount of revenue of one mill, then it would take 2.23 mills to go to 33%. So let me back up here because I'm going to show you something. When we look at mill levy history, we're currently at 47. That would increase the mill levy to 49.12. Historically, that's not a shock. Historically. It affects people. It affects some people more than others. I had a, a conversation with Dave and Mr. Bell about this. The tax burden is borne on the back of agriculture here. That's not fair. We need a bigger tax base in our community to share things like that. People have been paying taxes to support schools since the beginning of schools were taxed, since, since they were taxed. People without kids are paying taxes for school. My parents at 87 years old are still paying taxes for school. Taxes for schools are a pay it forward mentality. Somebody paid it for me, I'll pay it for somebody else. And that somebody else will pay it for the next generation. That's just kind of a philosophical sideline there. So, to put it into real perspective, I just used a $100,000 home in Lincoln, Kansas, to understand what this impact would be. So uh, um, I talked to Rhonda Wright and found out all the different valuations. Residential properties are at 11.5% valuation. 11.5% of appraised value is the tax valuation. An empty lot in this community is 12%. 
uh, agriculture is 30% of use production. So that's where your head will start spinning. It's very complex, and I don't understand it, but at least I get it enough to be able to give you this example. So if my house appraised at $100,000, the county would take that times 11.5%, and my tax valuation would be $11,000. So moving that mill over three places, that decimal point, Every mill of taxation to me is $11.50. So if this LOB authority was raised and it increased mills by two mills, that would cost me $23 a year, $1.92 uh, a, a month. I'm an educator. I would blink. But I have to be very sensitive and let you understand that there are people out there that it's not going to be $23 a year. It's going to be impactful and it's emotional and it, nobody likes it. But as I said before, my job is to give you the truth, whatever that may be. And that's why I'm sharing this information with you. Mr. John? Yes. Could you uh, show us some numbers on, let's say, uh, just a million dollars worth of uh, ag land? Well, that's where it gets really confusing because I don't know the use valuation of that. River bottom ground, they're going to value at a much higher rate. I've got 120 acres in Lynn Valley. You can barely go grass on it. It's so rocky. So it's appraised at peanuts because it is useless. It's hunting land. That's all it's good for. Um, so I can't without having a specific valuation of what that particular piece is. What I can tell people is, I'm gonna to try to explain this, I am not the county appraiser. Understand, no need. If you look at your tax statement, you will see tax evaluation. Whatever that number is, if you move that decimal point three places over, that will be your per mill dollar. So if it, again on my house, if, if my appraised value is $11,500, then my mill levy is $11.50. So it can be calculated, but my understanding is a farmer might have five different, 10 different, I don't know how many different tax statements because the land valuation is so different. Um, and then, you take that, yeah. and then you take that times, didn't we figure out it's 153 mills for Lincoln County? Is that what that total I think was? That's what it was at the top. So if you figure out your your per, your mill, take it times that, and it should come up to that, or take your total tax and divide it by 153, and that should back figure yeah. per mill, and then take it times 2.3, and it should tell us the I was just wanting the, the, the community to be aware of how this affects landowners in the rest of the county. If you have a good presentation here, I was just wondering if you could throw some examples up of, so the rest of, the, rest of the community can see. I, I can't pull them out of my head. I'm sorry. I know you can't. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It, it would be easy to take anybody's uh, property tax statement, cut the name off, and do some calculations on prime land, like my land, I call it worthless land, uh, things like that. But, but I want everybody to understand, and I want the board to hear me clear, and I want the community to hear me clear. I'm not asking that we go out and raise taxes. I'm showing the board options from which to operate from. But I will say this, I think you need to strongly consider there's a process that goes along with this and if this process doesn't take place by July 1, then it is not an option until the following year. And I will reiterate this, it does not, well there's a process that has to be done by July 1. Okay. or it can't be done this year. I would say this, raising this lid 
does not require this to be done. It's, it's kind of like having an ace up your sleeve. Do you need to pull your ace out? We don't know until the legislature figures everything out. And I apologize, this is a, I don't want to say crisis response, but seeing the amount of funding that we're going to lose, this is a decision that needs to be made so that a resolution can be passed, so it can be published in the newspaper. This is a big deal, and, and it needs to be carefully thought out. But I just wanted to share that with you. That's the end of my presentation. I will try to answer any questions that you have. I may need to take notes and talk to the county. I am not the expert in this, but I have gotten an education this week. So you're suggesting, or not suggesting, but giving us information so we, we have a backup plan if we get to our next budget year and everything happens at the state level that there's a concern about and we need the money, this would be our, this backup. is what we can pull up, pull out of our back pocket to keep running things. But you're saying we can only do this if we pass and publish a resolution giving us the authority to do so first. Yes. And it's all done yes. before July 1. So we would have to pass and publish the resolution giving us the authority to do so and then decide if. Then there's a 40 day waiting period. Okay. And again, I don't know if, you know, does it give us a, an ace in the hole? Yes, it does. I, I cannot tell you how concerning it is to me to be here for 10 months, to not be as ingrained into the community as every one of you are, and to have to present things like this. This is not a pleasant part of this job. And as we continue to inherit or, or experience issue after issue after issue, it is tremendously burdensome to me to take within this first year of this job and have to address these issues. This is not lightly taken. And I would commit and promise to you that as we build a budget, we will be as conservative as we can be because we must live within our means. And that is a task that I take on wholeheartedly, whatever comes with it. We all appreciate you and the fact that you have taken the look that you have at things that maybe you should have been looked at before and weren't. And unfortunately, on your watch, it's all, the dominoes are all really falling. The house of cards is really crashing down. But you're doing an amazing job of keeping everybody in the, informed. You're researching, you're doing your due diligence. And we all really appreciate that. And I think the community appreciates that. The school is the community. On your on your mill levy history, just for some clarification, because numbers don't lie, and there should be ways to see this correctly. Um, let me get all my ducks in a row. Okay, on your second, your first slide, your capital. No, yes. Okay, you don't necessarily have a slide that shows how our funding has reduced over the last few years, right? Due to wait, due to our kid count. Does that make sense? Because no, I don't have a specific. What I just show is end of year kind of stuff. Okay, so like back to the mill levy history mm -hmm. in fifteen. 50 mills, it took 50 mills to generate 30% of what our state aid was, right? Yes. And then that changed in 16 because our valuation went up, so each mill was more, or else our kid count went down, and so our state was less. So, so this fluctuates as as we go. Yeah. 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 It's nothing. It's valuation. And here's what's really interesting. We, we don't get some state aid 
because in the state's eyes, Lincoln County is a very wealthy district because of our valuation. It has gone up year after year after year, um, which is an interesting concept because when we have now 59% free and reduced lunches, that is a socioeconomic indicator of poverty. But because we're agriculturally rich, we look like a wealthy county, and, and that affects some funding that we cannot get. Yes, because, because ag land has increased and that creates the increase in valuation. Yeah, total valuation. So on the on to your question, and I went through tax papers with him a little bit, and on an 80, I have an 80 a ground that is strictly farm ground. It's upland, but it's farm ground. A mill on there is $7.92. So that is that is just 80 acres of farm, one waterway. And then where my house sits, my house and a quarter there, which is broken and pasture, it's kind of a mixture. So to me, that's, for most of us farmers, that's probably more where we're at because we're going to have buildings we're going to have whatever but that's 1383 per mill so somewhat more than the 1150 that you would have as a Lincoln resident with a hundred thousand dollar house but but that does include you know if you took out the house so we take the eleven dollars then then you're actually less than the than the 80 at ground I didn't do the other one that I had, um, maybe I did. But anyways, those are some numbers. If that helps you out, there is a flux. There is a. That's why it's so hard to figure out because it's just. You have to look at the actual. There's lots of reasons. Yes. Yes. Each person has to look at that, and it's like Scott said, it's going to affect you and me. But there's also five landlords that I know that own land and live out of county, so yeah. they're paying it too. And that's why for better for worse. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. There's less of us, so. Yeah. Yeah, but it won't affect me near as much as it's going to affect you. Yeah. And, okay. yeah, it is. And that's where it just, it's a disparity process. Yeah. Now we had, you know, a distribution center from Amazon and a industry, a manufacturing plant, and everything else. Things would even out. You share a little bit. These these schools that are at, you said your superintendents. You have four out of ten that are 33, and a few more that are 31. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming the ones that are 31 have already leveled the 33 percent. Have have raised their cap clear to 33, but they're only going to 31 to make it work. Right. And, and as, as the state finances go, you take the average, I, and I have to tell you, I don't know what the average was last year. Currently, the average LOB statewide will be 31% next year, and that doesn't take authority to do that. We can go 31 because it's an acceptable statewide average. If you want to go above the statewide average, and the statewide average was 30. When the statewide average goes to 31, everyone's at 31. But to go above that takes a resolution and board authority. One percent gets us nine, nine thousand, no, three thousand dollars, right? I guess I'm just curious. You're thirty thousand. Yes, one. If we went to thirty-one, it would gain us the thirty thousand. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Sixty. If we went to thirty-two, ninety. If we went to thirty-three. We could move to thirty-one because it's statewide average, but we are not currently there. No. Currently, currently. All these numbers. Work are based on last year's budget of 30. So, mold 
this over, run your numbers, let's have conversations. Um, When does this decision need to be done by? Do you have that somewhere? No, I just missed it. April fourth. April fourth meeting. Pass it. Publish it. Work for so many days, and then do a budget. I know, um, you know it was three or four years ago that the state came out at the end of June, was it? June or whatever, and said, you owe us $125,000, so we had to write that check back to them, and the next year it was like $75,000. Boom, boom. Two years, we're down $200,000, and if you don't have the money to pay it, they'll be glad to give you a loan to repay that. So, I mean, so our my point is, it's like those funds look good now, but if the state happens to come back, um, you know, they're going to take a hit real fast. So, and they don't say, mm, we'll work with you. I mean, it's, yeah, who's going to spend it back? And what was the, and that was that hurt. <laughs> yeah, was that just an audit that we should have caught? Or was I don't know. No, no, no. It was, no. no. It was just they did that kind of across funding. the board. Yeah, yeah. they kind of funded it. Funded. Funded. Yeah, it, we're, we're just to get X number of dollars, and then at the end of the school year, they're going to return that sort of amount and yeah. say, pay it back. So we paid you, so yeah, pay it back. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were totally at their mercy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, totally at their mercy. Um, I just want to make that statement, too, so people see this, and they can feel it's pushy. I mean, there's always, you know, yeah. there's always that, too. So and if they did that right now, we would be toast. <laughs> Do we, you had this, the staffing page, it, do we know our numbers for next year possibly? I do. Okay. Do they compare to some of this or is that something that I can get? Um, I would say that Mrs. Schmidt and I are working diligently to address that. Okay. Definitely a hard call. You know, we want to be good stewards of, of the money, but we also want to be respectful of our community members as well. That's why I showed you the two options. I work for you. You tell us how to proceed. You tell me philosophically how this you want this district to be, and then I'll I'll take care of it. I also like the fact that you can you can raise it but not have to use it. Yes. I like that little way, but but you said um, the state average is thirty one. It will be for next year. For next year, and if we're at thirty now. Yes. And it could be, be a, it could be a blended thing. I know it's not a one or the other. It can be a little of both. It can be a give of both. Which, as we budget, like I said, once we figure out what our real numbers are for next year, um, we can make better decisions. This just is a time issue. When I can look at 1% and be more than 3%, be more okay than 3%. Right. From 30 to 31, what Some of both. I mean, yep. I 
like you said, there's too many stupid variables in the thing. So. Yes. It is a life of uncertainty. And on record with the price of everything going up, I think you have done very well with the bus contract, and I think we made the right move at the right time for that. So, as far as knowing some. Maybe should have done five years instead of three years. We have a two-year option, so <laughs> worst case scenario. It's hard because it's not the option any of us want. Yeah. But it may be the only option. But it's a known. It's a known. It's with insane. everything going up as fast as it's going up, it's a it's a locked-in known right now. Yeah. You said you guys are getting yeah. our numbers together for class size. So we might have a little bit more to work at maybe during the April meeting. TJ, did you have anything that you want to say? We need to have now. We'll bring back to the April 12th. You said we're meeting so we can have some more discussion and yeah, we'll pull it over. Do some checking. That's why I wanted you to have paper lot copies lot. so you don't forget something. Thank you, Deb. Okay. Thank you, Bree. Motion by Deb, second by Bree. 